Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. My name is Matthew Dome and I am the Public Affairs Director of the International Gas Union. And thank you uh, to all of you on four continents uh, who have joined today's webinar on the role of gas on the road to recovery. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Andy Kallitz, the Deputy Secretary General of the International Gas Union, who will moderate today's webinar. Andy, the floor is yours. Uh, delighted to be on this second webinar. Uh, the first one that we held uh, at the end of March focused on uh, gas in Asia and, and focused at the time on China and Korea and Vietnam and India and Malaysia. And today we've come west uh, for another ex exciting story to take stock of where post pandemic we are in terms of recovery. But 2021 is also the 90th year of the existence of the global gas industry. And um, during this, the 90 years, we've seen firstly natural gas grow to meet tested demands in terms of heat and power generation and chemical feedstock that today supplies 24% of world energy. Um, it is equivalent to 4 trillion cubic meters of gas per year. It is consumed in 100 and more, more and more countries. It supplies 23% of the world's power. It is exported by pipelines from 20 exporting countries to more than 30 importing countries. It is uh, exported as LNG by 21 countries to 42 importing countries. But we've also learned and are acutely aware that as part of the energy transition and carbon and CO2 emissions discussion, that the consumption of natural gas uh, releases seven gigatons of CO2 per year into the atmosphere. And so now we are also beginning to see the rise of renewable gases. These include hydrogen, they include decarbonized gases and low carbon gases. And on the one hand, it's true that of the 75 million tons of gray hydrogen, which is produced per year right now, uh, mostly comes from gas. Uh, and that the green hydrogen volumes on, on, uh, in, in the global economy is still quite low, but are expected to grow quite rapidly. And we will see that the members of the International Gas Union are beginning to transform their businesses as part of the global energy transition. We have um, some very exciting speakers today. Firstly, we have uh, Maria Ritagali, who is the uh, chief executive of DESFA. DESFA is the Hellenic or Greek transmission system operator. We have, and she speaks from Athens today, sitting on the far right of your screen. We have Peter Zebedee, who is the chief executive of LNG Canada, uh, speaking from Vancouver today live. And we have Gabriela Aguilar, who is the vice president for South America of Accelerate Energy, speaking from Buenos Aires. We also have a fourth scheduled speaker, uh, Kwaku Oyake Adel, who is the mastermind behind Africa's first energy project. His flight has been diverted. He's at, just landed at an airport and uh, he should be joining us shortly. Um, we are today wanting our audience of, uh, on all four of the continents to participate by, uh, by, partic by uh, posting your questions. And you can see that you have a question screen on your control panel. And please feel free to answer, to ask a question there. And I will direct them to, to one of either Peter or Gabriela or Maria Rita or Kwaku to, towards the end. So with that said, let's get going today on this webinar. And we first go to, uh, to Athens, to Maria Rita uh, for her overview. Maria Rita, thank you. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Andy, to invite me to participate to this event, to this webinar today. And uh, let's say, being part of a panel of a group of panelists from all over the world, uh, I will try to give a Mediterranean perspective with, on uh, the, the evolution of uh, natural gas market in the region, both uh, in terms of, of uh, infrastructures, so pipe and LNG, and also, let's say, as you, as you mentioned before, uh, the trend toward uh, increasing the role of decarbonized gas uh, in the mix in the future. So Matthew, if you can go to the next picture. Um, the, um, the, the first uh, 
a point I would like to touch base is, of course, is the role of Greece. Greece is a small country, of course, and also as a gas, total gas demand is a relatively small market, even if it has increased quite significantly in the last few years. But it's a market which is at the crossroad of many flows and uh, is an entry door to much, much bigger markets, in particular, not only uh, toward the Balkans, but more recently also toward Italy. And uh, it's a country that has been and will be interested by significant investment with respect to na new uh, natural gas infrastructures. Uh, you probably all know about the completion a few months ago of TAP that has a, a, of the Southern Gas Corridor, therefore connecting Italy with Azerbaijan, and of course also the interconnection of the Desfa gas network with the TAP uh, at the end of last year, which has enabled a new source of gas from a new, completely new market reaching uh, uh, this uh, geography. And this has been a huge investment of, uh, in excess of 5 billion uh, euro. On a smaller scale, but still very relevant, are all the investments which are happening, uh, let's say, at the domestic level uh, to strengthen the connection with the neighboring countries and to strengthen, uh, let's say, the flows of gas in the region. So only DESFA has uh, a 10-year development plan of approximately 500 million euro. And uh, it, on top of that, there are investments uh, in, uh, uh, in the interconnection with Bulgaria and in the FSRU of Alexandropoli, which sum up to additional 600 million euro. And uh, the FSRU Alexandropoli, which is expected to take an FID later this year, uh, it's uh, a joint venture which also DESFA will be a 20% shareholder. Uh, there is going to be a lot of movement in this area, uh, as I said, in particular to uh, favor uh, the to support the decarbonization of the country. Uh, Greece has uh, taken a very strong view of uh, exiting uh, in a very short number of years uh, lignite, and this uh, implies uh, a grow in gas consumption for uh, power generation and also the need to connect new regions which were not uh, served by natural gas. On top of that, uh, of course, uh, to strengthen the access uh, to allow the access for some neighboring country, and I'm thinking now to North Macedonia, to sources of new sources of gas, there will be also new interconnection. And uh, as mentioned before, the FSRU Alexandropoli will be connected both to the Greek network as well as to the Balkans uh, through the IGB pipeline. Uh, this triggers also some need of strengthening uh, the system and. Uh, an important element uh, that is the need of uh, uh, storage capacity because Greece is one of the few countries in the region without a storage capacity and now there is an important uh, project which is being tendered for the Kavala underground uh, project. All this uh, investment has uh, created a liquidity in the market and for the first time uh, the possibility of having reverse flows with you know quite significant impact also on pricing uh, now Greece is interconnected with Italy in reverse flow and last year the abundant LNG which has reached uh, uh, the Mediterranean Sea has also been re-exported toward Bulgaria in reverse flow from Greece. And uh, those of you who look at the prices might have seen that as soon as TAP announced uh, the commercial operation date there's been uh, some, uh, let's say, um, decoupling from the Italian PSB to TTF with the first time a negative um, spread between PSV and uh, TTF. So, you know, in terms of pipelines and LNG, a lot which is happening in this small country, which is part of a much bigger geography, that is the Mediterranean market. And if you might, you can move to the next uh, page. Um, is a market where uh, not only there is a growing uh, gas demand, today there is already strong gas demand in the northern part of the Mediterranean countries, of course, but there is an expected significant growth uh, in the southern part of the Mediterranean, southeast, so with Egypt playing an important part, of course, of the growth. And at the same time, there is, a, let's say, of course, a significant amount of resources, but not sufficient to cover the total demand. So the energy dependency is expected to increase with, of course, the need to have a diversification of sources and new sources to supply the gas demand of the region. Um, if we can move now to the next page, this is uh, uh, something which is already happening, no, to the previous one, sorry, <laughs> with uh, uh, the flows of LNG, which are growing in the Mediterranean basin, uh, the, the, 
there is something happening with the slide in between. Uh, so um, let's say the Mediterranean Basin uh, from in 2019 and 2020 has become an important destination market for uh, LNG. So the trade of LNG has grown worldwide, but an important amount of LNG has reached the Mediterranean. And uh, um, this, uh, of course, has been favored by the very convenient LNG prices and abundance in the market, but confirming that Europe as a, in general and the Mediterranean can be an important swing and destination market for uh, uh, LNG producers. And we have, of course, LNG Canada here, and so this is a very relevant topic. On top of import, there are also new resources that are expected to support further gas market developments. In, the, uh, in particular, in the eastern part of the Mediterranean Sea, there are important new resources coming from either Egypt, of course, the large Zora Discovery, but also Israel and Cyprus. Um, and these projects, uh, on top of, of course, an increase of uh, resources available in Algeria. And these large discoveries, uh, again, will uh, trigger the need of some uh, infrastructure to be able to reach the, uh, the market. But looking ahead, and not, uh, let's say, uh, of course, in the overall framework of the big European effort toward the net zero, this infrastructure have a meaning not only as a short term, uh, let's say, infrastructure for the transportation of natural gas, but have an important role to play in the long term, also to enable the integration of, uh, let's say, renewable gas sources. And uh, Matthew, if you can go to my last slide in uh, the next one no the next one okay so uh, something which is uh, very relevant for uh, this region is also the abundance of uh, uh, ability to have uh, uh, renewable energy of course we know that there is an important component of renewable energy in the north part of Europe as wind but let's say the Mediterranean basin can be an important source of renewable power both for wind and solar and uh, let's say um, there are two macro trends uh, that uh, uh, we believe will emerge and are already emerging on one side the optimization of uh, the, the utilization of renewable versus optimization of the utilization of uh, natural gas so countries in uh, uh, North Africa where uh, there is the possibility of significantly increase uh, renewable energy production from sun will of course benefit from maximizing the use of these renewable sources and export gas uh, through the existing infrastructures so in general uh, reducing already the total CO2 emission by replacing uh, more polluting fuels in their energy mix but uh, more and more uh, as uh, a long-term trend uh, we see of course uh, a great advantage of having a lot of renewable power available in order to contribute to the production of uh, uh, green hydrogen that can be locally utilized and of course also shipped through the existing pipeline uh, system and the new pipelines of course to the new coming european hydrogen backbone so the evolution that we see today in terms of infrastructure in the region and looking at my Southeast Europe angle are going to play an important role really in the future. And in that respect, we are all focusing on making sure that all our new projects are going to be fully hydrogen ready to be able to accommodate uh, uh, this and to facilitate and support the decarbonization path. Uh, so I now pass it to Peter changing continent. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Maria, uh, much appreciated. Matt, if you wanna go to the next slide, please. Yeah, I really wanna say thank you for having me here. It's really a great privilege to be with you and to be included in such a distinguished group of industry leaders uh, here from around the world. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the LNG Canada uh, venture, we're, we're a joint venture comprised of five global energy companies with substantial experience in LNG. Shell, Petronas, PetroChina, Mitsubishi, and Kogas. And our joint venture at full build-out will ship an abundant supply of Montney natural gas to our liquefaction and export facility uh, here in uh, Kitimat, British Columbia. Kitimat is located 640 kilometers north of Vancouver on the traditional territory of the Haisla First Nation. And I'm pleased to say that construction on our project is already well underway. 
As many of you may have heard, it's actually the largest, single largest private sector investment in Canadian history. And it's of course the first major LNG project uh, for Canada. We're now into our third year of construction, having reached an FID in 2018. And I do want to recognize Andy Cowlitz here today for getting us through to FID and for setting us up for success. Now I recognize that 2020 has certainly been a, a challenging year for everyone. And yet despite some setbacks that we've encountered because of COVID-19, we continue to advance work around the globe uh, for our project and we're, we're reaching key and important milestones. We remain fully committed to delivering our first cargo by the middle of this decade. Matt, if you want to go to the next picture, please. As you can see from this recent drone image of our project site in Kitimat, things are really starting to take shape uh, as activities across all work fronts uh, progress. Not surprisingly, people are really starting to take notice of this activity and of the progress. And these include economists and forecasters who are consistently citing the LNG Canada project as a key driver supporting the economy here in British Columbia, local appointment, and economic recovery. COVID-19 has really punched a deep hole in, in the economy of British Columbia. And according to most estimates, we're looking at negative growth for about, of about 5% for BC for 2020. That figure could have been much worse had it not been for major energy projects underway in the province, including our project, uh, LNG Canada. The BTY Group, which is a global development and infrastructure consultancy, credited our project in its latest market intelligence report noting that non-residential construction activity increased in BC almost 7% in 2020. And it's that kind of activity which really has a positive uh, ripple effect through the rest of the construction industry, across the trades and craft, uh, into the upstream, and well into the northern British Columbia where our natural gas is coming from. This year, analysts expect British Columbia to post real GDP growth of 4 to 5%. Most expect our province to deliver one of the highest growth rates in the country here in Canada, but certainly the highest in the, in the western part of, of the country. And they credit uh, projects such as ours for helping to drive that growth. Brian Yu, who is a highly respected economist with Central One Credit Union, estimates that LNG Canada on its own will just lift the British Columbia economy in 2021, adding up to a full half percent of all of the province's gross domestic product. The more we build, the more awareness that people are having about our project, and the more people understand the importance to the local economy, to the provincial economy, and the more that they tend to support the project. And we've seen our polling uh, indicating support from British Columbia's um, for the LNG Canada project increase from 66% uh, support in 2019 up to a full 74% now. So it's a really uh, good news story. Matt, if you want to go to the next picture, please. I think the growing awareness and the favorable impression really hasn't happened by accident. We work really hard to explain how our project works with indigenous communities, businesses and nations, and, and of course, local businesses and organizations. And we put considerable effort into establishing and nurturing these relationships. There's really a strong business case to that, for, of course, uh, but the social investment is also considerable and extremely important. Building meaningful relationships with indigenous communities and, and nations didn't stop at our final investment decision in 2018. And, and these efforts have really put us on the path to reconcili reconciliation. This really can't be overlooked uh, when we talk about building a, a bigger and better future for LNG. Uh, Canada has a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and it's made clear that true reconciliation with our Indigenous peoples includes economic reconciliation, and that's access to jobs, to training, education, and ensuring that Indigenous communities acquire sustainable long-term benefits from economic development projects such as ours. And I'm really pleased to report that the cumulative value of our projects contracts and subcontracts to Indigenous uh, and other local businesses here in British Columbia continues to grow and has now reached over three billion dollars. And that's close to two and a half billion dollars of that to Indigenous owned businesses uh, and local businesses alone. Now this picture here shows a, a young man from the Haisa First Nation who works on our site 
And you can really see that benefits from our project are flowing in, into local and indigenous communities through employment, through contracting, subcontracting and procurement. The effect's really evident and, and people really, really are seeing it. Matt, if you wanna to go to the next picture, please. I think we also need to demonstrate that the benefits of natural gas from, from Northeastern British Columbia will have uh, for the rest of the world and, and for places that really need it. And this is another key part of the LNG Canada story. With our low carbon natural gas and electrification in the upstream, emissions controls along the pipeline and at the Kitimat plant, our GHG intensity is gonna be a full 35% better than the top performing global LNG facilities anywhere else in the world, and a full 60% better than uh, the global weighted average. Uh, we think that's a competitive advantage for both LNG Canada and for British Columbia as we enter into a global market that's uh, increasingly looking to LNG for lower carbon energy. The latest outlook from Shell, um, you know, the LNG outlook from Shell really helps to provide some useful context for this. And, and as we all know, LNG prices hit a record low in early 2020, uh, but did end that 12 month period with a six year high as demand in parts of Asia recovered and, and winter buying increased against a, a tightened supply picture. In China and India have led that recovery uh, in demand for LNG following the outbreak of the pandemic. China alone has increased its LNG ex imports by 7 million tons to 67 million tons annually, which is an 11% increase. India, the same 11% increase in imports in 2020, as it really looked to, to take advantage of low-priced LNG to supplement domestic gas production. And if you look at the total demand picture on the globe, um, it's expected to hit 700 million tons by the year 2040. And that's, uh, that's almost double from, up from a 360 million ton demand uh, as it sits in uh, today. Asia is expected to drive about 75% of that growth as it, uh, its domestic gas production declines uh, and LNG substitutes in for higher intensity uh, energy sources. And of course that tackles concerns like air quality and for the country to meet its emissions target. And China, um, have, with its announcement of, of becoming carbon neutral by 2060, is expected to play and, and continue to drive up uh, uh, large LNG demand and, and the key role that gas plays in, in decarbonizing those hard to abate sectors like, like buildings, like heavy industry, uh, shipping, heavy duty road transport. I think that you know really paints a very bright future for LNG and, and especially for LNG Canada. Matt, if you want to go to the next slide, please. I think it's, um, you know, understanding the role that our natural gas is going to play for decades to come is it's really exciting for myself and, and for all of my team. And, and watching how LNG Canada contributes to our province, to our economy, and, and to our local communities is really exciting. I think that we've demonstrated over the last 12 months through the pandemic, um, different and, and challenging as they may have been that, that really, you know, we're better and, and stronger together. So thanks very much. And I'm gonna hand it over to you, Gabriella. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, IGU, for the honor <laughs> to, to be here and, uh, and be a speaker. So I'm gonna talk about LNG in South America, current reality and future perspective. Next picture, please. And, uh, and I have to say that even though South America was an early bird in adopting you know, LNG you know, as a, an, an floating regasification solution in, back in 2008, uh, the truth is that the LNG has not yet developed its maximum potential, differently from Europe. You know, we've seen with Maria Rita explaining, and then the truth is that uh, that South America, in it's a sophisticated consumer of natural gas, and uh, but but the truth is that LNG has not yet uh, developed its maximum possibility to to in in terms of midstream, mid scale, and small scale. And what is the reason? I mean, we have in the infrastructure. Uh, in, in South America, we have a well-established interconnected network of 15 export pipelines, transportation capacity for regional flow for up to 4 million standard cubic feet a day, eight LNG regasification terminals with an aggregated capacity of 4 million standard cubic feet a day, 
And this is quite an interesting element, is that the regional multi-half structure of LNG terminals, which could allow an Atlantic Pacific arbitrage. Argentina has two um, uh, uh, regasification terminals, one permanent Escobar, one Bahia Blanca, which is turning uh, seasonal. Uh, Brazil has five regasification terminals, and Chile has two permanent uh, uh, terminals. Next uh, picture, please. So what, was, uh, what has been the role of LNG in South America since you know, 2008? Basically, there are three elements, three most relevant elements uh, that uh, were favorable to, to, to South America. First of all, energy is, is for the security for the system. You know, why the LNG has been used in South America to secure the energy system in general, you know, differently in Argentina from Brazil or Chile. But the truth is that provides additional amounts of natural gas in the peak demand. For instance, in Argentina or in Chile is for to cope with the winter, as we can see in the graph, and or in Brazil to, to, um, to assist in the dry season. And of course, it's also in a clean and affordable energy. Next picture. The second element is the LNG value, you know, in terms of cost reduction. I mean, this is, uh, this is clear, but sometimes it's not that visible in terms of how much, you know, cost the countries, you know, re uh, reduces instead of utilizing liquid fuels, not to mention, you know, the environmental aspect. But let me give you an example, the Argentinian case. Bahia Blanca and Escobar regasification terminals and the operation uh, during the period of 2008 and 2019 represented a cost saving for the country of $12 billion. You know, because if not having had those two terminals, the truth is that Argentina could have to uh, consume liquid fuels. Mm -hmm. Next picture. The third element, which is important in terms of the benefits of using LNG, is about the clean energy. Now, everybody knows about the worldwide train, the Paris Agreement, the emissions reductions, the energy transitions. And also, I mean, we have to say that LNG utilization reduces the CO2 emissions in almost 35% less than liquid fuels. And then again, and allow me to bring the Argentinian case, between just only between to, you know, 2016 and 2019, if liquid fuels could have been burned instead of gas, the emissions could have been reached seven tons, million tons higher. Next picture, please. <laughs> okay, so how we see, you know, what are the perspectives for LNG future in South America? In, in, in South America, there is a dilemma between their LNG role and versus the monetization of natural gas reserves. And why is that? Because Argentina and Brazil have significant gas reserves. You know, the, you know, the, the Brazil offshore and Argentina back and forth. But the truth is that LNG doesn't compete against with the local you know, natural gas resources. It's only, you know, a, a technical tool to complement additional needs of uh, energy. Also, there is an increasing need of clean energy to promote regional growth. And there is a real regional game change. And why is that? Brazil, we see that uh, is enacting a new gas law that is only uh, missing, I mean, the, the, the president is now ready to be uh, enacted by the, by the president Bolsonaro. Chile is in uh, implementing a decarbonization plan for their for its uh, power plants. Bolivia, it's a, it's a, we can see a significant declination in their in its gas reserves and, and production, which could be uh, reducing uh, their possibilities to supply gas to border countries like Brazil and Argentina. And Argentina has a pendular you know, development of back and forth. Next picture. So how we see the, the real opportunities in South America for the LNG? The next one, the other one. So we see that now, as, as commented, there are um, 
many terminals in South America, LNG terminals. So we expect a growing utilization and open access in those existing terminals. And of course, the construction of new LNG terminals, particularly in Brazil. We see also the expansion of LNG track loading facilities and uh, you know, and LNG tracking and loading. Then we have a real opportunity for mid-scale and small-scale opportunities, you know, for regional gas sales and distribution for industrial and power sectors, mid-scale and regional LNG distribution of onshore, but also upriver. Paraná River or Amazonas, LNG to power projects, and also a, a huge potential for LNG bankering. Other LNG opportunities that we see is that, you know, considering the gas reserves that existing in Brazil and Argentina, we see as a potential reality the construction of liquefaction plants, you know, to, um, to develop those reserves and to uh, give a uh, stability of production and uh, incremental growth of the, of the economy in those countries. LNG storage, the truth is that South America doesn't account with uh, uh, energy storage or natural gas reservoirs. So LNG at the end, it's, a, it's storage, in it. it's energy storage. So this could be a solution for South America. And Finally, is we see LNG as security for producers export in order to allow producers to supply natural gas to, to South America to supply their local needs, but also to uh, allow them to continue uh, exporting on a long-term basis. So we see that South America has not yet reached its maximum potential and uh, we hope to see that happening in the next uh, decade. So thank you so much. Going to Andy. Thank you. So next we go to Africa, where our fourth speaker, Fatou Boyaki uh, Adye, uh, is going to speak to a very, very exciting groundbreaking uh, development in Ghana, Africa's first uh, energy importer. He is at a Kenyan airport after his flight got diverted. Uh, I'm trusting as I am over the moment that he's going to be online and speaking. So, Kaku, over to you. Hi, everyone. I don't know if you can hear me. I don't think you're missing very much. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's been a bit of a, a, a collection of calamities here in, in, um, in Kenya. Uh, we've got some COVID issues. Um, we've also got uh, a rainstorm and, a, and as I said, a conflation of all of those things has meant that um, the line isn't great, but I hope that we can get across um, to all the people listening um, the kind of status of our project, how excited we are and, and what we think it can mean for both the region um, and the sector in, in, in the continent in general. Um, first of all, to thank, every, thank, thank um, Andy and, and Matt for the opportunity to speak and and grateful to be on the panel with such um, other experienced and esteemed colleagues. Um, I think Gabrielle has really done a great job of talking about some of the things that I'll, I'll speak to, especially about um, small-scale LNG and the options that that provides. Um, so our first slide is just to go through um, the project. Um, the title is Two is Sometimes Cheaper Than One, and that speaks to the fact that um, most projects of this nature, especially the ones that have been proposed in Africa previously, have been single to, um, FSRUs and what we tried to do was bring together something novel that spoke to the issues that you face in Africa which is the fact that the initial anchor, anchor customer and the anchor market may develop just on the back of having LNG and, and cheap and reliable gas available. So it's a, it's a project that needed to grow with the market and needed to be flexible enough to um, build as the market changed and that meant that we went for a barge and FSU as opposed to a readily available FSRU. It means a bit more capex, a bit more risk, but then it allows you to shape the solution to kind of meet the problem. Uh, another uh, important part was that the project was privately funded. Um, so we had no government support, no government backing um, in terms of capex, but we did have a lot of government support in terms of wanting to see LNG 
and gas delivered. What that meant was that we needed to utilize uh, interesting sources of, uh, of equity and debt. And a lot of that, I'd say 80 percent of that came from Africa. So I think it was important to identify um, an African solution, financing solution, because people understood the, the development need, the, the potential and also the risks and were able to tailor a financing solution that was fit for purpose. So terminal itself, as I said, is comprised of a floating storage unit, an FSU. And, um, and then we built an extensive breakwater to utilize um, an area of support that was probably um, unutilized. We then tied into um, a conditioning station at the Volta River Authority's uh, kind of gathering point, which is the point at which all of the natural gas in that eastern enclave of Ghana to the ground on Ghana itself. Ghana it, uh, has about let's say nearly 2,000 megawatts of, of demand split evenly between the western side of the country and the eastern side. The west is where all of our indigenous gas is and the eastern side is where I'd say a large part of our demand is. Uh, and so we would do this with support the eastern side which has megawatts existing currently. So our first cargoes are expected in, in kind of early Q2 um, 2021, so this year. So to see the next, please, man. Data on um, on some overview on the actual facility itself. Um, uh, Shell is our, 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 our anchor client, and they're the, the party we are selling uh, gas. And that's a key part of the story is that in order to get infrastructure over the line, as you'll see, See one of my there are some issues to face um, sub Saharan Africa, sub -Saharan Africa. And, and one of the ways to make the project bankable was to um, partner with Share Gas Dessa. Um, and so they're the, they're the party that's doing that. And the party that's buying that gas is the Ghana National Petroleum Company. Um, the terminal is designed um, to a nominal to about 220 million standard cubic feet a day and has 99% availability at that rate, which again in sub-Saharan Africa is really important because we're very reliant, as you'll see on my next slide, on, on um, associated gas. And those of us in the upstream know that associated gas isn't the most reliable unless it's on a huge scale and the demand requirements are quite low. So having that level of availability that comes with LNG projects is hugely important um, to, to, to capturing the market. We have a maximum throughput of 400 million standard cubic feet a day, which is again building a facility which is able to cater for what we think is a great market. When you're able to deliver cheap gas, when you're able to deliver reliable gas to the market, and the solution needed to be able to fit that. And the other piece which I think was very important is that it was always optimized for small scale reloading. Um, I think Gabriella talked to to how that's uh, changing um, the nature of uh, of the of the LNG market in, in South America and in West Africa that's really key. We have a lot of markets that aren't in of themselves able to sustain large-scale infrastructure but do then start to grow those markets and you can see them develop really really quickly. If you use the right type of infrastructure solution they can the infrastructure solution can as the market grows. So that small scale approach um, Proking and, and meeting off-grid customers was a really key component of the solution as well, and I think it's just bespoke to us, but something that can work. It's Matt. Just some pictures uh, to show you where we are. That large breakwater, um, which took a long time to build. Uh, the um, the marine marine environment in Ghana is quite challenging, um, but we were able to do that. And then the FRU, which is the barge arriving in Ghana. And then um, a lot of the uh, subsea, subsea pipeline, flexible being laid, and then some of the onshore pipeline. Tema, which is the location of the, um, the, the, the facility, is a very indu heavily industrialized area. So that's great because you've got a lot of markets, but it's very, very difficult when you're trying to put a pipeline through there. So um, that just shows some of the hard work that, that went into doing that. And a large part of our EPC contractor base was, was local um, because they understood how to manage some of these complex issues. Uh, next please Matt. And then just trying to summarize some of these um, issues and the solutions that we, we, we faced in Ghana, which again I don't think is specific to Ghana, 
but um, it just kind of gives you a, a context as to why it was so difficult to deliver a, an LNG regasification facility in sub-Saharan Africa. So w what our country is kind of characterized by is a large residential customer base, which is um, fairly low in terms of um, income. Um, and then that's juxtaposed against a very high value industrial base, mines, heavy industry, um, who are able to pay a lot, but require really reliable sources of energy and can't afford to have um, fluctuations in electricity supply. Um, our understanding of speaking to mining customers, for example, is that it's on stream um, if they are if they're shut down for a period. So what that means is they they tend to look for bespoke solutions for themselves. They're willing to overpay for those, and they're willing to go off grid because the consequences of being uh, unreliable or supply the business. The other issue that we are facing in Ghana is that most of our indigenous supply is deep water. The other, the other point I was going to make is that um, we had an issue with un unreliable and high cost fuel supply, which was primarily driven by the fact that um, a lot of the gas that we see in our part of the world of, of oil, which in turn means that the use, its use as a fuel source um, in a downstream is a secondary requirement. It's actually prim primarily used um, to support the extraction of, of oil. The uh, non-associated gas, which is available, um, is again in the deep water. So whilst it's reliable and, and can have a materially positive impact, it's more expensive. And so LNG kind of fits in quite well as a solution that is reliable, um, that is low cost and, and can come in um, if the inf at, at kind of a reasonable rate if the infrastructure is right. The other issue we're facing is poor transmission networks. Um, we have very, very significant issues with um, black, regular blackouts, and we also have a number of off-grid customers who are off-grid because we're losing maybe 20 to 30 percent of the electricity produced by um, as a result of, of, of losses in the network. So when you add all those things together, it creates um, challenges that can be solved by LNG, but you need these bespoke solutions. And some of the issues I talked to about trying to create um, scalable um, opportunities, trying to create scalable solutions, trying to ensure that you're able to deliver bespoke um, solutions to Africa, um, African problems are part of the way in which we were able to get over those those uh, major issues and barriers. So uh, apologies, I think I've broken up a few times, but I hope that gives you a sense of, of the project and some of the issues we faced and some of the solutions we were able to put forward to, to mitigate them. Great, great overview and uh, congratulations on being the mastermind behind Africa's first energy turbo. Please continue submitting your questions. I'm going to immediately go to our panel and uh, I'm going to challenge each of them to answer their question in one, the question that I'm going to shoot at you from uh, in one minute flat. First one goes to Peter Zebedee. Uh, Peter, your question comes from Ray Lunen and says, BC implemented worker restrictions in December, January. Uh, how have you recovered from that? How has that impacted uh, uh, construction? That's a good question. Thanks for that. Um, and it, if I just step back to the start of the pandemic, we we kept three uh, priorities for ourselves as as we uh, started into this. And the, what, number one, we're going to protect our people. Two, we're going to protect the community. And, and third, we're going to protect our project. And we've stayed true to those three simple principles. I think they're a good guide for our leadership to make the right decisions. Um, at the uh, end of the year in 2020, the provincial health authorities implemented um, restrictions on the amount of workforce that we're able to uh, bring into our Kitimat facility for construction. Uh, we worked together with them over the first two months of 2021 to um, uh, I put together a restart plan with the appropriate level of uh, controls in place and, uh, and what has turned out to be a gradual ramp up of our workforce back to full capacity here. Um, earlier uh, last month. Um, uh, not the, the least of which is we're now uh, have implemented rapid antigen testing for every worker who comes onto the site. Um, it's proven to be a robust barrier for us in, in ensuring that our folks are healthy and we're keeping COVID across the site in addition to a myriad of additional controls around hygiene, physical distancing, et cetera, that we have uh, in place. 
uh, along with uh, robust medical facilities to support um, quarantining if, if people are exhibiting symptoms or, or starting to feel uh, so feel ill. So um, at the end of the day, we're, we're back up to full capacity. Um, we're monitoring things closely and staying true to our, to our three priorities that we set out for ourselves right at the start. That is a long one and answer, but a very comprehensive on a very important subject. Next question is to Rita Gali from Charles Illinois. And he says, you've just seen one of the last, possibly last pipelines of, for natural gas coming to Europe from Azerbaijan. Uh, can you see next pipeline still being built, Maria Rita? Uh, sorry, and I couldn't catch the last. I, saw, I heard until Tapak and the last the sentence I missed it. Gas, natural gas pipelines being built into Europe. Well, I have some problem with the connection, but uh, okay, I will try to to provide an answer in any case, uh, even if I miss a little bit the question. Yes, we saw one big import pipelines uh, that is a tap, uh, and uh, and of course uh, this is not uh, the 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 only evolution that can come closer with respect to the tap because uh, there is already a running uh, market test uh, that, uh, let's say, will be carried out this summer in order to the possibility to double the capacity of TAP. So already the market will, uh, will, will be able to express a view in uh, the near term whether or not additional capacity is, uh, is needed. With respect to new large scale infrastructure, of course, this is becoming more and more complex. We know because of, uh, let's say, difficulties in raising financing for, uh, let's say, nature for fossil fuel infrastructures. There is, of course, in the region, the EastMed pipeline, uh, which is, uh, let's say, an important uh, uh, also geopolitical uh, project uh, that uh, may still see, let's say, strong support for, uh, for various reasons. And uh, if this materialize, of course, a company like us will be highly interested to be part of this because it will be a project landing in Greece uh, and where we can see a lot of synergies with our network and with other existing infrastructures. So I think it will be more and more uh, uh, an effort of ensuring the maximum maximum efficiency in capex uh, and using as, more, as much as possible existing as uh, in, in light of uh, let's say again uh, the evolution of uh, the energy transition uh, and the uh, you know increasing difficulties in attracting uh, grants and financing for this project next question is from costa rica from javier bonilla who says great contribution uh, gabriella could you comment on the future development of small scale LNG markets in Latin America, especially in Central America? You're on mute. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you for, for asking that because that's that's where we see you know the, the potential of uh, you know expanding the, the use of LNG. You know. In the and and this is quite important to see how the LNG has become more and more flexible along the years. You know, we've seen uh, you know ten years ago we've seen you know uh, long term contracts you know and uh, you know and permanent terminals you know to supply gas to you know big markets. Nowadays we see that that line has been moving you know to smaller markets and also to flexible regasification terminals. And I can say, you know, for instance, in Argentina, we've just won, you know, a terminal in uh, the awarding of a terminal in, in Bahia Blanca will stay only three months. And going to the question about Central America and the, and, and, and the possibilities of small scale, that is exactly connected to that. You know, the more we see flexible connect, uh, uh, solutions is that to have the opportunity to develop small scale markets, in particular the Caribbean, you know, or the um, replacement of LPG and connect distributions, you know, which nowadays are, are supplies with LPG or just doesn't have any, any, um, any, any energy. So in particular, the, the uh, reloading, you know, the, 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 the banker LNG, the, the possibility of a track LNG, you know, or LNG distribution at river, those are elements that will contribute a lot. And the flexibility on that will contribute a lot to developed markets, particularly in South, in South America and Caribbean as well. 
to apply. Um, next question is for Kwaku. Kwaku, on the assumption that you can hear me, Lucy Hein asks, firstly, Kwaku James Ball says, Andy, uh, you've got it wrong. Egypt imported LNG before Ghana. So uh, um, <laughs> James Ball is correct as always. Um, but then in Sub-Saharan Africa, but Lucy Hein asks, when will the FSR, when will the FSU arrive and will small-scale energy vessels be required to supply regional markets, Kwaku? Could you hear that? Yeah, I can hear that. Um, and he's right. So, yes, yeah, so well, I think I said Sub-Saharan Africa. Because um, I think, uh, having worked on ELNG when I was at BG, the market in North Africa is a very different place. Uh, it's a very, it's a very, it's a much more established market. So Sub-Saharan Africa has some very specific issues, but he's right. It is Sub-Saharan Africa's first free gas. Um, the FSU should arrive um, sometime at the end of this month. So um, we're doing extended discharge for the in cargo, and then the FSU will uh, arrive to to fill in the gap. Um, in terms of, I um, saw so the other question, Andy, was about small scale LNG, was it? Can, from, from Lucia, I ask, can, will there be any retransportation of LNG up and down the West African coast? Yeah, that's a core part of the model. As I said, um, a lot of the other markets that we see, um, such as in Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, uh, Sierra Leone, in particular Liberia, are all markets that we think have the potential for um, or the, can benefit significantly from LNG, but don't have the scale to underpin on their own um, the infrastructure required to deliver it. So from Tema, we've oversized the facility specifically to allow it to service those markets. And then in the first phase, hopefully do that through small scale. And as those markets grow through trucking, microgen, uh, direct, direct deliveries, then we hope that we can scale the solutions to ensure that then it can satisfy that growing market. But I think that's a key part of the model here in West Africa is about using infrastructure efficiently and effectively um, and sharing um, the load and allowing those companies that those countries that can underpin to support those countries that can't and then allowing those countries to benefit and grow and then um, supplementing infrastructure as we go. Yeah, that's a core part of the of the model. Future plans, quite cool. Next question is for Peter Zebedee. Peter, you, you must know that this question was coming from Giada de Paolo. He says, Can you confirm that train one will be online in 2025 and train two in 2026? Well, I don't know if we'll get that specific, Andy, but I'll give the answer. So we're, we're absolutely on track to meet our commitments for delivering our first cargo before the middle of the decade here. Um, and I'm going to follow that up with one more question, which came from Dave Luminen. And uh, the question was, will Coastal Gas Link delay your first cargo? Uh, we're working closely uh, together with Coastal Gas Link right now on, uh, obviously, uh, project schedule uh, and costs. Uh, and we do not expect that to uh, have any impact on uh, delivery of first cargo. And again, I'll just link back to we're, we're on track to meet our commitments for delivering first cargo towards the middle of the decade here. Thank you, Peter. Next question is for, <clears throat> for Marita Gali. Uh, Maria, how are you preparing your staff at DESFA for the energy transition? Uh, well, thank you, Andy. That, that's a very relevant question given uh, what we were discussing before. Uh, so, first of all, uh, we have uh, uh, we are focusing on uh, uh, reducing our own emission. Uh, so, let's say a, a great amount of effort uh, is and will be put in the next few years in uh, let's say defining our net zero strategy for our own business, uh, and this is already happening in the Revitus terminal uh, in all our facilities. And in parallel, uh, with respect to the ability to become a vector of new gases, uh, we are already uh, on one side, uh, all the new projects, for instance, the new pipeline to West Macedonia, where, uh, let's say, there is also an important uh, project for, uh, uh, let's say, future, not an hour project, but an important project for future hydrogen, green hydrogen production, the new pipeline will be 
already designed in order to be able to accommodate up to 100% of hydrogen so that it can be used today as a gas pipeline and in the future as a, in the reverse flow to deliver hydrogen to the rest of the, of the country. As well as in the course of this year, we will uh, carry out an assessment on the, the, let's say, on the status of our network, which is quite new, and uh, see in general which will be the uh, adaptation that might be needed in the future to be able to transport the blending and then progressively in growing amount of renewable gases. Thank you. Uh, great, uh, great indication of how you're preparing yourself for the future. Um, next question is for Peter. Peter, what is the local content strategy for Kitimat or for, for Energy Canada in Kitimat? So what is your local content strategy? Uh, we're the, absolutely... the question comes from Pascal Sequeira. Oh, thank you for that. I mean, our our, um, our partnership um, and commitment to HISA First Nation is is first and foremost. We would never be where we are today without the support of our uh, Indigenous um, uh, friends and community members and partners. And so it's a very comprehensive strategy that not only includes um, benefits during the construction phase, as I mentioned, through um, local jobs, training, uh, procurement opportunities, and support for local and indigenous owned businesses, but extends well into operation uh, through sustaining benefits to uh, to high school First Nation uh, jobs that, uh, you know, uh, highly professional jobs that extend for the life of the facility 40 plus years, um, and a, a true partnership that enables uh, and supports the export of uh, clean Canadian natural gas to, to Asian facilities. Um, uh, I think there's a really good example um, in, in High Sea Marine, which is a joint venture between High Soap First Nation and, and uh, North Vancouver Bay C-SPAN. Uh, this is an operation that will provide um, harbor tugs and escort tugs for the, for the life of our facility um, that applies uh, uh, employment for local High Soap uh, community members um, and is operating one of the greenest tug fleets anywhere in the world. So I think it's a real embodiment of our, our support to our, our local uh, community stakeholders and, and First Nations and, and partners. Um, audience on four, even five continents today, I hope that was an interesting uh, IGU webinar today on the road to recovery. I'm sure you'll join me in congratulating Maria Rita uh, and Gabriela and Peter uh, and also Kwaku for their uh, pioneering work uh, and for the groundbreaking work and for the courage and determination to build not only a, a global uh, LNG and gas industry, but also to begin to move and position it in terms of being cleaner, in terms of CO2 emissions and methane emissions, and preparing for also the, the next phase of other low carbon gases and zero carbon gases. With that, I conclude today. I regret to say we took all the questions that we could as fast as we could, but there were at least 20 more that I didn't get to. I close by reminding everyone that the next big, uh, great uh, gas event in the world is the 28th World Gas Conference. Uh, the current dialogues at that event features every aspect of natural gas, of LNG, of hydrogen, of biogas. Uh, and of other low carbon gases. And this is where in Daegu, where the co-gas the co headquarters are, where culture and energy meets, and you can see that the, uh, the call for speakers is, and, and participants is about to go out. We expect participants from 90 countries. It is well timed to be in, uh, in Daegu next year in May. You can see that the date uh, top right. And uh, look forward, to, it's also well timed in terms of our escape from COVID. That's why we postponed it to 2022. Thank you for attending today. And uh, from London, where the IGU headquarters will be operational from August this year. Goodbye and thank you today. Uh, could the speakers just remain online for a moment as the rest of our audience signs off? Thank you. Um, I also just add in closing the. Uh, the recording of this event will be available, including the slides that were shown in the recording within the next 24 hours, so by Friday. Thank you, Matt Doman, who pulled it all together. Thank you all.